Hi there, I'm Sue Stockdale, host of the Access to Inspiration podcast. We've saved a fantastic episode for the final one of this series. And I've got Jeff Tricky to thank for introducing me to our guest today for episode 89, Alex von den Hoeve. Alex is a wildlife tracker and author who worked for many years at the famous Londolozi Game Reserve in South Africa. During this time, Alex was paired with Renius Malongo, a local Schengen tracker who grew up as a hunter-gatherer in the Greater Kruger National Park. And for 27 years, the two have worked together, tracking wild animals all over the world. In 2009, they set up the Tracker Academy, a non-profit NGO that trains indigenous wildlife trackers. And they're proud to say that 94% of those trained have gone on to permanent conservation jobs. I think you'll learn a lot in this episode, including how leaders in the boardroom can learn about decision-making from the skill of the tracker. It's a little longer than our normal episodes, but I hope you'll think it's worth it because Alex shares such insightful stories with us. Welcome to the podcast, Alex. Thank you, Sue. Thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to speak to you today. I've never spoken to an animal tracker before. I'm wondering, what does that involve? Animal tracking or animal trackers, there are very few of them left in the world. And obviously in Southern Africa is one of the last places that people still track wild animals. And that has been kept alive by the industry of ecotourism and generally wildlife conservation. Tracking is the study of animals' footprints and all their signs and putting that all together in order to understand what the animal is doing and to be able to follow that trail of evidence and eventually catch up to that animal. So historically, tracking was used for simple reasons of survival. People would go out and track animals and try and catch and kill them to feed themselves and their families. And the trackers who did well at that ate well. The trackers who were poor at tracking suffered. But of course, with rapid urbanization, a worldwide trend in these days, people have moved away from landscapes where they have to get food that way by hunting and gathering, as well as in our country, the legacy of apartheid removed people from their land and brought them into locations where there was no opportunity to continue the ancient culture and tradition of tracking, which is very sad. And that's why we don't know exactly, but we've lost the vast majority of traditional tracking skills over the last 50 or 60 years. And that's really the work of the Tracker Academy NGO that myself and Renius from Klongo and, and Gaynor Rupert co-founded in 2010. And the idea of the Tracker Academy is to restore this ancient skill for the benefit of wildlife conservation and also to use tracking to do social good. Well, I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit later in our conversation, Alex. I almost want to go back to the earlier part of your life. I know you grew up on a cattle farm. At that stage, were you even thinking about animal tracking as a career? As a young boy, where did you think your life was going to take you? As far as I remember, and from the youngest age, I've always wanted to live amongst animals and be in wild places. I am not sure that my upbringing on the farm engendered that. It may well have. We lived on a farm in the South Cape Coast at the foothills of the Tsitsikama Mountains. Beautiful, lush pastures. My parents and grandparents farmed Aberdeen Angus cattle, and it was a very tame environment. Yes, it was a farm, but it was very tame by comparison to the Kruger National Park and other big African wilderness areas. So I'm not sure that, but I was surrounded by nature. But as far as I remember, I just wanted to be close to nature. And I remember when I was in boarding school, I was sent to boarding school very early at the age of nine or 10 years of age. And I would stare out the window and just wish that, that I was in the bush and I was tracking and amongst animals. So I'm not sure quite where that came from. Genetically, somewhere, I know that my grandmother on my mother's side was a, a fervent naturalist, and she spent a lot of time in nature, and maybe I got it from her. Well, we never can tell sometimes where in our past these interests lie. It was in 1995 that you joined the Londolozi Game Reserve as a game ranger. Yes. Would you say that was a pivotal point in your life? Absolutely. I spent 23 years living at Londolozi, starting in 1995. I met Renia Simklongo, who I've worked with for the last 27 years there. 
I met my wife, I had our two children, and it's been a university for me in many ways, not only because it's a game reserve where there are wild animals, but also meeting interesting people. And I was 19 years of age at that time. I'd I'd done a year of a marketing degree and I was supposed to go back. I was going to take a year off. And that was 27 years ago. (laughs) Never went back. And so Londolozi, my life there certainly had a profound impact on the trajectory of my life and particularly my career. And I understand that you and Renius have got a, a really formidable partnership between the two of you in terms of Ranger and Tracker. Would you agree with that? And if so, what's made that special? Well, I think someone else has to say that, but I do agree with this statement. But I appreciate the kind words. Yes, Renius and I were thrown together in 1995. We had no selection in each other. We were put together by the head ranger of the time. And I was 19, as I just said. And I think he assigned me to the most experienced tracker to try and offset this imbalance of inexperience because I had very little value to add to that job and very little knowledge, quite frankly, of that environment. And so I think the head ranger put me together with this very experienced tracker to try and keep me safe, A, and B, brings some modicum of experience to the safari and professionalism to the safari. But Renius... And I have been together ever since then. Our lives have changed and they've evolved together. People often ask, why did you and Ren get along so well? And I've often thought about this. And there are two things. One, we both love to track leopards. We both loved leopards, the animal. And I was so intrigued and so enamored with the tracking skill that I observed in Ren and his ability to produce a beautiful leopard sighting from a very obscure little pug mark on the ground two hours later. And he was very open to teaching me. And he could see that I wanted to learn his side of the job. I wasn't just interested in taking photographs. Most guides arrive at these game reserves and their single objective is to meet wealthy people and take beautiful photographs, which is fine and noble. But I was for some reason different. I don't know why. But I used to get bored in the sightings. I never owned a camera. I was more interested in the pursuing of the track, the tracking process to find the animal. Once we'd found the animal, I was keen to go and find the next set of tracks and not sit and watch it in the hot sun. And then secondly, Renius and I share a very similar sense of humor. He's a fantastic mimic. He's got a great sense of humor. He laughs a lot. He's a tall man. He's charismatic. He's good looking. He's just great fun to be around. He's warm. He's personable. And I'd grown up in a family that I was sent to boarding school very early. And in some ways, he became a fatherly figure to me as well. He's old enough to get me out of trouble, but young enough to get me into it. He's 13 years older than me. And he's got a very youthful persona. And so we had a lot of fun together. We met lots of interesting people. But most importantly, We would wake up in the morning and we would want to go and find fresh leopard tracks, follow and find them. And that was what we lived for, for a good eight years. And we had a a number of very interesting experiences, some dangerous experiences, some just very memorable ones. And I think those years cemented our relationship very early on. Now, you've got me intrigued, Alex, to think about what the skill of tracking actually involves because I can get the sense of your desire and curiosity to want to follow a track almost the journey and not the end point seems to motivate you more from what you're saying so what is the skill of tracking what are you using broadly speaking tracking has two components the one is the study of the animal's tracks and signs that's very analytical that's the identification the interpretation of everything from an insect's track to an elephant's footprint and everything in between. And we want to know the difference between a beetle and a grasshopper's track, a male and a female leopard, a black rhino and a white rhino. So there's a lot of rational, analytical thinking around that component of the tracking skill. The other, and more interesting for me anyway, a side of the tracking skill is what we call trailing. That's the following of a set of footprints. Let's take, for example, of a lion. You find the fresh lion footprint And then you set off and you follow that animal's trail of evidence. And you can imagine that animal can walk wherever it wants to. It may not walk on soft, beautiful sand like a dog does on the beach. I'm not talking about tracking in that way. This animal can walk over stony ground, through long grass, thick bush, through water. And the tracker has to display refined ability for refined observation skills 
to be able to follow that set of evidence and ultimately catch up and find that animal and view it. And so, and tracking is for the most part seen by the West as a very mystical, magical skill. In fact, it is not. It is a legitimate skill like soccer or cricket or golf. It has both a physical and a mental component and with deep practice can be mastered. At least, yes, some people have a greater aptitude for tracking, just like people do in every kind of vocation. But the more one practices, the more one immerses oneself in nature and practices tracking, the better one can get. And you can take people from the city and turn them into a reasonably competent tracker within a year. Well, that was going to be my next question is if somebody like me showed up to be in your tracker academy and learning the skills, what would you be looking for in the average person that doesn't do that for a day job? I almost would like to use the word detective. It seems to me there's something about what's the evidence you're aware of. That's what I'm imagining. I'm imagining intuition and senses come into play here and also a dogged determination because I'm imagining you're going to potentially lose the track as you go along. So that's how I imagine it being. What would be the skills for somebody that's the average person with no experience? I've studied for many years the best trackers that I can spend time with in the world. And what I've noticed about the top most elite trackers in the world is that they have the ability to balance detail, analytical thought with creative, holistic thinking. Said another way, focused thought with diffusive thinking, focused thinking versus diffusive thinking, rational versus creative. And they have a very active imagination, but they are comfortable in the detail too. And so I'm always interested to try in interviews for our students for Tracker Academy to try and understand whether uh, how much of these two areas do they have skills in? In creative thought, problem solving, linking, seeking connections, being aware, the ability to quieten the mind and evaluate the evidence as it comes to you, as opposed to having predetermined ideas about what an animal is doing or where it's walking. It's very difficult. And it's part of my life's journey to try and understand with people like Jeff Trickery, who you know, from a psychological perspective, what are the attributes? What are the competencies? What are the personality traits that make up the best trackers in the world? And we do understand some of it, but there's a lot of work to be done on that front. I'm wondering if you've got any real life examples of journeys that you can recollect and share with us. I know when I heard you speak previously, you talked about the story of the Lost Lion Cup. <laughs> I'm sure there are many others. Give us an example of real life, what happens when you're out there. Yes. Okay. I mean, I can tell that story. Let, let me start with a, another one, though, which is a bit more abstract. Many years ago, Renius and I had these VIP guests at Londolozzi, and they were there for one game drive. Normally, people stayed for three or four nights. We had them for one game drive, and they really wanted to see a leopard. They'd flown in on their jet. They'd come to Londolozzi because they'd heard that they have a good chance of seeing a leopard. They put them with Renius and I, but they gave us one four-hour game drive to produce a leopard. So there was a lot of pressure on us. But fortunately for us, that morning game drive, one of the other guides had found a leopard that had killed a, a bushbuck, a small antelope. And the majority of the, the carcass was still intact. So the theory was that that leopard would still be there feeding on its meal. And that wasn't far from the camp. So we thought, well, it's going to be easy. We'll just drive them over and we'll go and view the leopard feeding on the bushbuck carcass. We get to within about 100 meters of, of where this bushbuck and the leopard had been found, and Renia stops me. Now, the trackers sit on the front of the Land Rover on a little seat on the hood on the front left-hand side of the bonnet of the, of the safari vehicle. He stopped me and he said, I think that leopard's gone to have a drink. And so I said, yes, okay, maybe it was a hot day, but let's just go and check where the leopard, the, where they found it. And, go and, and he said, no, no, let's just stop here. Let's have a look and see if we can find tracks on the road where the leopard has left the carcass and gone off. There was a water hole nearby that he'd remembered that there being. And so we got off the vehicle. I was rushing him a bit because it was hot and I didn't want the guest to be in the vehicle for too long in the direct sunlight. And we walked a few hundred meters and we couldn't see any tracks of the leopard. So I said, it must be still there. Let's just go back. Let's drive in. And I noticed he was dragging his feet a bit. Something was bothering him. Something that was so straightforward and conventional for me, he was not seeing it the same way. We get back to the vehicle. I start to drive off the road now to the right in the direction where the leopard was from the morning. 
And the next thing, a tree squirrel starts to make an alarm call to the left behind the vehicle. And Renia spins around on the tracking seat and says, stop, 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 stop. The leopard's behind there. I told you, the leopard's gone. Turn the vehicle around. He was so forceful and so sure of himself. Like he gave me no chance now. I could virtually see the tree where the leopard had been in the morning. He wouldn't let me go there. He said, the leopard's it's gone the other way. It's left the kill. It's gone for a drink. I turn the vehicle around. And now we start heading in the direction of this very subtle squirrel's alarm call being made. We get about halfway along. He says to me, you see that big jackalberry tree? He says, head straight towards there. That's where the squirrel was calling. And we go a little bit further and he turns around to me again. He says, go faster, go faster. So I said, why? He says, the leopard's moving. So I said, how do you know the leopard's moving? He says, listen to the tree squirrel. The tree squirrel is telling us that the leopard's, he hadn't even seen the leopard yet. He'd now known that the animal was not only there, but what it was doing. Anyway, we drive to this big jackalberry tree. We park, no leopard. And I remember a guest on the vehicle says, hey, Alex, are we tracking squirrels or leopards? <laughs> and before <laughs> I could mutter out some stupid answer, Renius clicked and there that leopard came through the woodland just up ahead. And we had an amazing sighting. He'd interpreted from the squirrel's call that the leopard was there. And then from the pitch and tone uh, of when the leopard got up, obviously it heard the vehicle. So it felt a bit uncomfortable and sort of it decided it wanted a bit of space and it got up and the squirrel reacted to that. And that's just an example of the refined skills, the refined observation skills and knowledge of bird language and alarm calls that you only get with a long time, close association, immersed life in nature to be able to make that kind of decision. And I've seen him make those decisions and make those calls again and again and again. I tell people all the time, there's only one person in my life that continues to surprise me after 27 years of working daily with him. And that's Renia Simklongo. <laughs> what a lovely story. What's coming to my mind, Alex, as you're speaking, is something about being in relationship with your surrounding, with the animals, with one another, with your guests. I'm intuiting that from how you're describing it to me. What would you make of what I've just said? It's an interesting question. It's a great question. You know, nature operates on relationships. The relationship between the rocks, the soil, the trees, the plants, the birds, the animals, everything is in so intricately linked. And, and there are relationships there that are ancient and that are fundamental to the success of the system as a whole. And I have been living in nature long enough to witness those relationships and to see how important they are and how clear they are, and how they do change. If man makes changes to the environment, nature doesn't complain, it simply adapts. And at the end of the day, if our relationship with nature breaks down, we're only going to do ourselves a disfavor. Nature will endure in some form or another. We are the ones that will suffer the most. And I think that from a relationship perspective, there's nothing more rewarding than walking a journey to a deepening relationship, whether with another human being, with an animal, or a patch of wild land. There's nothing more rewarding. You learn so much about yourself. There are places in Africa that I go to once a year or once every two years. And every time I go back to these places, whether to train trackers or to visit to friends or so on, I see myself in relationship with that place. It's like a timestamp. I can remember how I felt. I can remember what trauma I was perhaps dealing with. I can remember my emotional state of being, having been in that place a year or two before. And that's only because there's a relationship here. And so I am learning through my connection, learning about myself through my connection with that piece of land. And I love doing that. I love going back after having been away for a while because it's like looking in the mirror as you go there. That's how I would explain my relationship with some of these beautiful wilderness areas. But of course, relationships with human beings, whether your wife, your husband, a work colleague, to me, long-standing, deepening, robust relationships must be the most rewarding thing that we can get involved in. And I take 
the weight of the importance of relationships from what I observe in nature. Mm, powerful words that you're sharing, Alex. I'm wondering, given that your environment is not the boardroom or the business environment necessarily, your workplace that's outdoors and in nature, for those listening to this podcast who may be business leaders, I'm wondering what are some of the skills or the qualities that you think they could learn from what you're talking about and your experience in nature? I'll go back to the track. Some of these master trackers or expert trackers really have unique ways of making decisions and going about their work. And because nature is just wordless, because the animals that these trackers pursue are wild and cannot be controlled, and because the environment in which they operate is vast, there are no signposts, there are no algorithms, there are no consultants to talk to. They have to become aligned with the signs that nature is giving them in order to make good decisions. And so the best trackers in the world make holistic decisions. They are constantly taking in three elements of information when they make any decision. The first is the detail. They're happy in the detail, as I mentioned early. They're good at the detail. They're analytical people. Secondly, they never make a decision without considering the environmental significance of that decision. How does that work? So, for example, if I'm tracking a lion and I can't see its footprints, how do I know where it's gone? Where am I going to go next? Because physically, you cannot see every single footprint. Because as I said earlier, they walk on this difficult terrain where footprints are virtually invisible. But they've still got to stay on track. And how do they do that? Well, one of the ways is that they are constantly thinking about how is the landscape having an impact on that animal's movements? How is it having an impact on that animal's intentions, its motives? So, for example, a hungry lion is going to go towards an area where there are lots of prey. A tired lion is going to go to water and drink. A lion that's looking to link up with the rest of its pride, it will go into a neighboring territory. Whatever it might be, the landscape and the inhabitants of that landscape have a profound effect on how that animal moves and how it decides on where to go next. And trackers always take into consideration that impact, the impact of the environment. And then thirdly, almost most importantly, and Renius has a beautiful saying for this. He always says, to track well, you must put the animal in your heart. Said another way, you must get in the skin of the animal. And really what that's about is trying to understand that animal's purpose, trying to understand its central motivating aim for going or doing what it's doing. And the answers to the questions around detail, the questions around how the landscape is affecting that animal, and the questions around what's its purpose. The answers to those three questions give the tracker color, give the tracker an understanding of the activity going on around him, and then he can make good decisions. And business leaders, I think, if they would adopt a similar decision-making model, could make better longer-term decisions, taking in not only just the detail, but how their decisions impact the environment, and ultimately Thirdly, what is the purpose of the decision? A lot of decisions are made without one really giving much thought to what is the greater purpose here. And so that's where I believe that trackers can help business people. It's fascinating what you're talking about, Alex. The one thing that strikes me from what you're saying there is about use of time. And by that, I'm imagining a tracker must slow down sufficiently to take on board that information. In business, sometimes I observe leaders moving very quickly. They get data from technology, information, and then they make very quick decisions and then they move on to the next thing. So it's all about fail fast and move forwards. My sense from what you're describing is it's somewhat different to that in the tracking process. It seems to me to be allowing time for observation and thinking. Yes, that's right. They give themselves time. If I had to answer your question, question and with one answer it would be that they go slower rather than faster. That being said, though, they're guided by the environment. So when the tracks are clear, the soil is open, the bush is clear, there's no immediate danger, they can move faster. But if the tracks are no longer clear and they obscure, they slow down and they start to look for other information that can help augment the, the detail on the ground. If tracks go into very thick bush, 
they'll slow down because the risk element starts to be elevated. You don't want to walk into a lion with her tiny cubs in thick bush and surprise her there. That's very dangerous. And so in many ways, the tracker's time, his cadence is dictated by the structure of the landscape and what's happening and how much information is available to him. Trackers won't go quickly if it's risky and they won't go quickly if they don't have all the information. Yeah, that seems very important. You're already giving us so much more in-depth insight into what a tracker does and the skills that they have, which then leads me on to want to know more about the Tracker Academy and what that is and how did you set it up and how do people learn? When Renius and I were working together as guide and tracker, it became clear to me that Ren could do things, tracking things that other trackers could not. And we started to have a conversation about how do we ensure that this ancient skill is handed to the next generation and that doesn't die out completely when people like eventually retire. And bear in mind, Renius is one of the last generations to be raised along the lines of the traditional hunter-gatherer of the Shangan people. And so there are no more left, no more people that were raised in, in that same privileged situation as Ren was. And so what's left only is therefore for us to formalize the training of trackers in order to restore this ancient African knowledge and skill. And in 2009, Renius and I resigned from our jobs at Londolozi and we went into the chilly wind of unemployment with a dream, a dream to start a school that would do that very thing. It would restore tracking skills. And we traveled around the world funding our passage by teaching tracking in places like North America, Australia. India to try and raise money to start the school. And I'm afraid after a year of travel, we didn't have a single dollar to show for our efforts. And on the beach back in my hometown on the coast of Plettenberg Bay, I remember saying to my mother that I think I need to phone Renius and tell him we need to go and get our jobs back at Londolozi because we had failed. We really had failed. There's no other way of saying it. As fate may have it, a good friend of mine introduced me to the Rupert family, who are a very wealthy and influential family in South Africa. And long story short, I met Mrs. Gaynor Rupert, and we did some work with her. And she agreed to fund and found the Tracker Academy. And that was in 2010. And we received our first eight students. Since then, at the end of this year, we would have been going 13 years. We've trained just over 220 trackers. And this is a statistic I'm most proud of. 94% of those 220 are now in permanent conservation jobs, all of whom were unemployed, many without hope, living in rural villages close to wildlife areas, jealously staring through high fences, seeing people driving around and viewing animals and staying in fancy lodges. And now 200 of them, because they are trained as trackers, are are now employed in the conservation industry, either in anti-poaching or in ecotourism, animal monitoring and, and other areas. And so that's the work of the Tracker Academy. We're an NGO. We are entirely donor reliant. The hyena on my chest here is our logo. I thought by using the hyena, no one would want a hyena as their corporate logo, but it's the best tracker in the animal kingdom. And it's actually an extraordinarily good caretaker of the next generation. So in many ways, it shared the philosophy of developing the next generation of trackers in this instance. People have said to me, which advertising agency helped you develop that brand? It was just a photograph I took and had it traced onto a shirt. And it's become really synonymous with the Tracker Academy and tracking in Africa. And so that's the work of the Tracker Academy. We've just opened a new division called Rhino Guardians, where we are training trackers specifically now to protect rhino, man tracking, which we are hoping to make a material impact to help reverse this trend of losing rhino in Africa. So it's marvellous what you've accomplished in that space of time, Alex. And I think what you're reminding us of is that ancient skills are still valuable in modern day. Exactly right. And that's exactly the point, Sue. This is an ancient skill, possibly 100,000 years old, that has still got relevance in modern conservation efforts. And as I've spoken to you earlier, I think has relevance in the boardroom too. I think business leaders can learn to adopt the tracker mindset, the tracker mentality. There's a particular pro to tracking a lion that is in no way different to tracking a customer or a strategy or a project. And that process can be discussed, it can be internalized, and it can be used by corporates to better track whatever objective they're tracking. And so I think there's a lot that the modern world can learn from this almost forgotten ancient skill of of tracking in Africa. Well, you know what I want to ask you next, of course. What's the process? (laughs) Okay, I'll give you a brief 
the explanation of the process. The process involves five interrelated activities, and each activity is reinforced by a particular mindset. And these activities sometimes run in parallel. They're not clear cut. That's why they're interrelated. The first step or first activity is to find the right track. So the tracker wants to find the freshest track that's going to give him the best chances of success. Getting started on the wrong track can have far-reaching consequences. And I think that's true for anybody in any situation. The mindset there is a very healthy dose of discernment, the mindset of discernment in spending time finding the right track to follow. I see this inexperienced trackers. They'll jump off the vehicle and, and want to follow the first line track they see on the ground. A guy like Renius will pass up two or three opportunities to track lines. He's looking for the freshest track that's going to give him the best chance of success. Secondly, once you've found the track, you now want to start following. You're literally following footstep by footstep. Now, that requires refined observation skills. As I said, some tracks are very subtle. You're not only following footprints, you're also following urine marks, droppings, territorial marks, feeding signs, all kinds of signs, alarm calls by other animals, as in the case I just gave you. And that requires a lot of a curious mindset. The most curiosity comes into it there. And tenacity, you know, as you said in the beginning of this interview, sometimes it gets really difficult. You cannot find your next piece of evidence and you've just got to continue. You've got to persevere and you've got to be extra curious because there's almost nothing that's irrelevant when you're tracking. It's all about prioritizing what's most relevant, but it's all relevant. So that's the following. You're walking along a trail of evidence effectively. And the next activity would be at some point, the tracker is unlikely to be able to outwalk or outpace a lion. At some point, you've got to close the gap on that animal. You've got to anticipate and leapfrog ahead and try and get closer to that animal and try and get a return on energy. And that requires activity. That requires holistic thinking. And that goes to what I was talking about earlier. That's when you're looking at the detail, you're looking at the animal's purpose, you're looking at how the landscape is impacting that animal's behavior. And the answers to those three questions give the tracker the picture, mental picture of what's going on. They can then form a hypothesis of where the animal is, and they leapfrog ahead and they test that hypothesis. When you're tracking an animal, until such time you find that animal, you are basically always in beta mode. You only really launch once you found the animal. It can be quite frustrating, but the closing of the gap is important. It requires a creative mindset, an innovative mindset, an intuitive mindset, a holistic way of thinking, very much big picture, looking at all the data now, looking at all the information and forming a theory about what this animal is doing and then testing that theory and having the courage to do so. But like anything you track in life, at some point, you're going to go off track. You're going to lose the trail. And that is just inevitable. I don't think I've ever tracked a lion or any animal for that matter, where at some point we haven't lost the trail altogether. And that requires a lot of courage to confront the facts that I've now, I'm off track. A lot of trackers will pretend to track. A lot of people pretend to go on. And so you need to be bold. You need to be very aware of your mental biases about what you're doing, what information is important to you and what you are seeing. But trackers make use of two very logical, very basic methods to regain a lost track. One is Either you go back to the last point you were on track and start again, this time with extra care for the detail, or you decide, you know, I've been on this trail for long enough. I have a good sense of where this animal is going, and I'm going to anticipate. I'm going to leapfrog. I'm going to back myself to be able to cut the tracks up ahead some. And that's speculative. And better trackers get quite good at doing that when they lose the trail. But there's a whole mindset around losing track. A lot of people... When they lose track in life, they become despondent or they become angry or they want to assign blame. The tracker never does that. He is 100% accountable to losing that track. He simply goes back and goes again. A, he has the courage and the honesty to confront that he's off track. And B, he's going to look at the detail. He's going to make assessments based on evidence and he's going to go again and he's going to be tenacious. And then the fifth element is if you've done all this well enough for long enough, you'll hopefully have an encounter. And the encounter is the final activity where you finally find that animal or that objective or that goal that you set out to track and find. 
and that's important. The encounter is essentially a trust building opportunity. When you find that lion on foot, you want that encounter to go well. You don't want to upset that lion because it can either come and do physical harm to you, it will turn around and run away and you lose your relationship with it. You'll lose your encounter with it. And so you want the encounter to go well because if the encounter does go well, it sets up greater opportunity for future tracking success. And the mindset around the encounter is one of gratitude and respect. And so really, those are the five elements of the tracking process, the five interrelated activities. And what's most important there is getting the mindset right at the various phases of the tracking process. And what I've just explained to you, we call the tracking success pathway. And we've applied the pathway many times in business. It's astounding how you can use it and you can make use of it to track and find whatever is important to you in your life or indeed make sense of what's going on around you in your life. Well, I'm glad I asked you that question, Alex, because you've just given us so much rich information about the process. And I'm sure for our listener who may not be in the world that you inhabit, if they're in the world of business, they can think about how that applies to them. Finally, since we're called the Access Inspiration podcast, I'm wondering who or what inspires you? Nature inspires me. Animals inspire me. Many conservationists inspire. I'm inspired by a man called Dr. Ian Player, who passed away, sadly, a few years ago, who started the Wilderness Leadership School. And he had a wonderful relationship with a Zulu man called Matubu Mtobela. And I really do look up to his work. He was instrumental in saving the rhino from extinction in South Africa in the 1960s. And he was instrumental in reversing that trend. And here we are, 60 years later, back at it. And so I often reread his books. I'm also inspired by a man named Dr. Ian McCullum, who's a, a mentor of mine, who's a psychiatrist, a conservationist, a poet, and a wonderful man who sees the value of nature in all of our lives. And so I'm not sure if I have a single person, but it, it's an array of people and experiences. You've wonderfully role modeled in a way, the intention of our podcast as a whole, because we aim to bring a diverse range of guests for our listeners. And I think you're describing in a way that similar approach, one person isn't necessarily the only person that can inspire us. We can all take learning and that inspiration from different places. I've learned so much from you today, Alex. If our listener has enjoyed this conversation as well, how might they find out more about you and the work that you do? Involved with three websites. The one is alexandren.com. That's Renius and my personal website and a blog. Then we have trackingsuccess.tv. It's a virtual adventure we've created where we take people tracking. We take corporate senior executives and corporate groups tracking in the boardroom virtually, and we put them in the boots of an actual expert tracking team. And we ask them to make the same decisions that the trackers had to make on the day. And those decisions have consequences. You can read all about that on trackingsuccess.tv. And then, of course, the Tracker Academy NGO is trackeracademy.co.za. That's a website dedicated to the work of the Academy. Wow. We'll put links to all of those things on our show notes. It's been a wonderful conversation with you today, Alex. I've learned a lot by what you've said. And certainly I'm going to go off and think about how I engage with the wider system around me in, in a completely different way. Thank you so much for your time. It's a great pleasure. Thank you so much, Sue. Thank you for having me. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode and it's given you some new insights and cause to reflect and think. Remember, you can read a transcription of this and all our other episodes on our website at accesstoinspiration.org. We will be back in mid-January next year with a new series. And in between now and then, we will showcase some of our earlier episodes for you to enjoy once again. I hope you stay connected with us.